Good morning. I want to welcome you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. If uh, you are here for the first time, we say a special welcome. If you're here for the first time in a long time, we also welcome you. If you're here with us uh, online, also we welcome you in the name of our Lord. Uh, today we have a gratitude moment, uh, and this is it just happened this past week. Uh, how many of you know about the little free pantry in Batavia? Yeah, you've seen it. Uh, it was on Washington's, is it Washington or Trumbull? Washington, close to that area. So uh, anyway, they had to relocate. Uh, they've been asking us to pray about a new location. And somebody from our church had the idea that why don't we host this here? So if you go out, I know most of us come from this side of the building, but it is now, uh, the beginning of it. They're trying to f figure out a structure for it. It is on this side as you go out through these doors to the Liberty Street. So we're very happy to partner with them or increase the partnership with them. And so it will be here. So if you give any food donations, uh, the little free pantry is the idea is they take whatever, you, how does it go? Take what you want, leave what you can. So it's a Oh, thank you. Oh my goodness, you could read that. Good. <laughs> it's right in front of me and I can't read it. <laughs> All right. See, she's pretty impressive. So the idea is to share in the community and they have events and they have a lot of uh, different uh, ways to empower and, and help others, but in the spirit of community, not in the spirit of uh, toxic charity where we just give something to someone and not see that they can be agents in their, in their own uh, development. So anyway, this is happening and I'm excited about it and I'm giving thanks to God for it. And so you could take a little tour, but it's just the fridge at this point. Plugged in outside, <laughs> pretty impressive. And it has cans in it, I love that. <laughs> I opened it yesterday, I was like, it has ca cans, but that's for now that's what they have. Um, so, today also I wanted to highlight the dinner uh, from 5 to 7, come anytime, and if you're a Bills fan, uh, I'm assuming a lot of you are, we'll have the game playing, so you can come and not miss the game, and I uh, can tell you the food is all made from scratch. Lasagna is just being made, and the, everything is, um, Wendy, do you want to say anything about the food? Well, I'm not the no, no, I know. I know, but you witnessed some of it yesterday. Quite amazing, lots of dishes and making it with Eric. Yeah, the sauce, everything. Very nice. Yes, thank you for those who showed up. And yes, yes, everything. Yeah, I know meatballs from scratch. I know. I know. He was he was late yesterday because of their daughter was in a competition. Anyway. And then he calls and he says, oh, why don't you get the meatballs started? I said, excuse me? <laughs> I've never made meatballs in my entire life, so no. <laughs> you want the church to be poisoned? <laughs> so I uh, hope you will join us tonight for that. Uh, we're, this is, our, I think, our second week of the sermon series about inflation and the uh, cycle of blessings and looking at holy currencies. Uh, we have been, if you've been alive and listening to any news, you've heard about inflation. If you've gone to the store, you've felt the impact of inflation and uh, the whole idea of looking at life with that lens of scarcity. Uh, so today we're working through this um, idea that instead of, we're trying to see how inflation impacts us, but looking at it from a spiritual pers perspective how we could be focusing on God's abundance in our lives. This is the invitation, is to look at all the currencies of our life um, and not just money, to remind ourselves of how important it is to keep these holy currencies flowing so that we may live in the joy and flow of blessings. The six currencies are outlined here. Currency of relationships, uh, so last week we talked about that. This week we're talking about the currency of truth but there's a currency of wellness, currency of money, currency of time and place, currency of gracious leadership. And the important thing is always 
letting these flow, so not holding them to ourselves. Uh, and, and that's kind of the spirit of this invitation to look at inflation through that lens and to really think of how do we deal with inflation and the root causes of inflation, which are related to greed, to thinking that the economy always has to grow and always moving in more in the direction of more consumption, thinking that we would be happier for that. So each of these currencies, as I said, is important in the sense of it being used and flowing. So being shared and received all the time. And today we're talking about truth. Now, we know how uh, truth right now is a very difficult concept for us uh, in our world today, especially if you look at the divisions in our country and you see everybody, I was talking to someone this week and you know, this person was saying, well, how could they be believing this? How could someone believe this? I'm like, okay, all that you just said, flip it and they look at us you know, the conversation we're having, they believe the opposite and they think we're crazy. So I said, it's just the way it is right now. And that's how you look at it. And I said, you just have to, to accept that people really see it as the truth. And so one of the things about truth is that when it comes to the currency of truth, part of the problem is that our expectation that one person, one group would have a hold on the truth. So you know, the sense that I'm, if I'm right, you must be wrong. So there's always that uh, binary or dichotomy or um, a way of looking at life as one side versus the other, or one truth above another. And one truth being objective truth. Have you heard people say, well, objectively speaking, it's like, how, what, tell me how you could be objective. I mean, have you left your body and, uh, <laughs> left your whole human experience and can really be objective? No one can be objective. And it's very disheartening to hear that, I know, because we want to think that I can be so objective. You could, have you heard people say that? Have you said that? I'm being objective here. There's no such thing. There's no objective truth. Uh, maybe there is, but we can't access it ourselves. Like, truth is bigger than us, and so the idea is to really look at the importance of community, of speaking to one another, of looking at the past, especially if there are human mistakes made, to talk about the different voices and experiences so we could reach uh, to a higher truth. So truth is more of a conversation, a process. It's, we're always striving for truth. Truth, yes, God and truth is bigger than us, but who of us could sit here and say, yes, I know God objectively. Can you say that? I know life objectively. I know this one person. Have you had that experience? So like, oh, you know someone for so many years, and then they surprise you with an act maybe of kindness, or it could be an act of really bad things. And they're like, wow, I never thought this person is capable of being so kind, uh, because you just assumed a lot of things about them. So truth, uh, and I'm not watering it down. I hope you're not looking at this saying, oh, everything is relevant. It's not, it's, it's more of this dialogue and conversation. So I invite you today to journey with me on this path of the currency of truth. So I invite you to take a deep breath and prepare your hearts for worship. gather, O oh God, in the spirit of truth and of grace. We gather, opening our hearts to you, to your mystery, to help us to listen to one another, to listen to your spirit, to listen to the whispers of your truth all around us. Help us today as we look at this currency to Look at the world with open hearts, with a grace that is not close-minded, 
but is always open to new revelations, to ideas, to people, to seeking in community and in love. Please stand and join us singing Broken Vessels. when you think about truth. I'm looking at Lisa and thinking of 
tell the truth, but uh, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. We talk about that as if it's really easy. And you know, one of the things uh, often that is said is that eyewitness is uh, mo probably the most unreliable thing. Because <laughs> you see something that happens and somebody else sees it, they see it very differently. You had that experience or remembering, especially remembering stuff in families, in, in court, wherever we are. So what comes to mind when it comes to truth? It's this big idea. Somehow we can manage it. Um, have you, uh, Dan, have you had to go to court to be a witness, like as a state trooper? And how did you find that? There's one truth, okay, <laughs> Your, yours, okay. But because there are facts, now there's a difference here. Truth is bigger than facts. That's, that's another issue too. We tend to think that it's gotta be factual um, and it's, the truth is a little bigger than. than My job was to search for Your job was to search for the truth and defend the truth. So there are people who are really, this is how they take it upon themselves, that this is the truth. But if you uh, live long enough, you see it in a variety of ways. Yes? I was thinking, like, why can't somebody go up and say, like, that's their truth? That's their truth. Okay. Yes. And think about history. I mean, you teach right. history, and, and it's often told from the perspective of the powerful. So we hear a, one kind of truth. And today, there is debate about certain parts of our history uh, and who gets to teach what. And it's a hot debate because the people struggle, say, well, but that can't be true. If they're saying that, then my truth is not right. I mean, you think about uh, Columbus Day and now Indigenous Day and the whole uh, truth of who was right and how for a long time people believed that it was explorer, this and that. And then the story changed when we heard other voices. But today I'm gonna show you a clip. I mean, some of you might, have, might remember this is an old movie, A Few Good Men. Uh, there's a great scene, a court scene. You can't handle the truth. <laughs> it's, it's because Jack Nicholson is defending himself, you know, Tom Cruise is the lawyer who's trying, or uh, prosecution trying to help, uh, so the storyline, uh, I actually have to look up the storyline because it's been several years, but the storyline is that uh, there are two Marines who end up killing one of their uh, fellow Marines and they were being prosecuted, but it turns out that there was an order that came from on high and so that's what they're trying to uncover, uh, that Jack Nicholson somehow was involved in uh, the killing of this Marine on Guantanamo Bay. Anyway, so uh, we'll watch this scene because I want you to think about this, how it comes across and why Jack, the character of Jack Nicholson thinks that you know, he has the truth. Recess. I'd like, like an answer to the, the question, question, Judge. The court will wait for an answer. If Lieutenant Kendrick gave an order, Santiago wasn't to be touched. And why did he have to be transferred? Colonel, Lieutenant Kendrick ordered the code red, didn't he? Because that's what you told Lieutenant Kendrick to do. Object! Wait, 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 wait! You cut these guys loose! Your Honor! You are more than a ceremony trans! Your Honor! You doctored the logbook! Then I can't be! You consider yourself in contempt! Colonel Jackson! Did you order the code red? You don't have to answer that question. I'll answer the question. You, you want, want answers? answers? I, I think, think I'm entitled to you. You want answers! I want the truth! You can't handle the truth! Son, we live in a world that has walls, and those walls have to be guarded by men with guns. Who's gonna do it? You? You, Lieutenant Weinberg? I have a greater responsibility than you could possibly fathom. You weep for Santiago and you curse the Marines. You have that luxury. You have the luxury of not knowing what I know. That Santiago's death, while tragic, probably saved lives. And my existence, while grotesque and incomprehensible to you, saves lives. You don't want the truth because deep down in places you don't talk about at parties. You want me on that wall. You need me on that wall. 
We use words like honor, code, loyalty. We use these words as the backbone of a life spent defending something. You use them as a punchline. I have neither the time nor the inclination to explain myself to a man who rises and sleeps under the blanket of the very freedom that I provide and then questions the manner in which I provide it. I would rather you just said thank you and went on your way. Otherwise, I suggest you pick up a weapon and stand opposed. I tried to cut the parts where, you know, there's language there. So, what do you think? What was happening there? One is asking, trying to uncover what happened. The other person thinks of the truth as bigger. But what, what version of the truth was uh, the character of the colonel? Nicholson. It hit, fit his motives. And he's talking about defending the country. I mean, you know, not a bad thing when you think about it. In his mind, he's thinking, I'm defending the country. Even if it takes that, you know, one person gets sacrificed, you know? So what's interesting, of course, is that, again, back to that truth of who gets to define it, who gets to say, it's my truth versus what you can't handle the truth because the truth is bigger than you and what you're thinking, it's bigger than this one incident. So again, thinking of objective truth is not as simple. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is a difficult topic because we tend to live in a culture that says, no, there is one way to look at history, one way to look at events, one way to look at the truth. And think about the conspiracy theories that are swirling around in our country. And some of them, it's like, how in the world do people believe this stuff? When you listen to it, it sounds so outrageous. And it used to be, there has always been conspiracy theories, by the way, always. And they used to be more like margins. People didn't really, you know, it's like, okay, you go believing that. But now people believe them as the truth. And it's hard. What do you do when someone tells you, you know, like, what's his name? Uh, Jeff, uh, Epstein's DNA was mixed or with aliens and then we're being injected with it through the vaccine and it's like, oh my goodness, how do you get that? I mean, there are, or there are magnets in these vaccines. I mean, there are, were so many stories about the vaccines and it's like, I wish they were that effective. <laughs> I mean, they're not that effective, clearly. Uh, and it's, it's interesting how people get into that because we're, we're hungry for something, for the truth. I think underneath it, there is good motivation because people are hungry to experience the truth. And we know that these ways of thinking of right and wrong or your, uh, your facts are more important than my experience. If you had that experience or you tell someone, well, I had a really tough time at this hospital. Well, that can't be. I love that hospital, I love that uh, person. That can't be that you had that experience with them. You deny their experience. Sometimes, you know, when someone says, you know, I experienced prejudice because of my skin color or my sexual orientation or whatever it is that people discriminate against. And then someone says, but you can't be. That's not true. We all get into these mindsets of, again, saying one over the other or not wanting to listen to one another. So the currency of truth seems to be in short supply. It's tough right now. How could we as people of faith, as people who uh, believe in the truth of, of God's love, how do we live it? How do we practice it? And so Jesus spoke a lot about truth, especially in the Gospel of John. There are several, uh, several pieces in the Gospel of John, and I'm, it's mentioned about 25 or uh, about 25 times in one way or another. Jesus is the witness to the truth. Jesus is the truth. And it talks about, so it's, it's interesting to listen to some of these. So this is from the first chapter. It says, and the word became flesh. This is talking about Jesus and lived among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. Oftentimes it's linked to the word grace, too. And then the law indeed was given through Moses, grace and truth through Jesus Christ. 
then God is spirit, and those who worship God must worship in spirit and truth. And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Is Jesus saying that? It's like, wow, what does that really mean for us? John 14, then here, Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. This is, uh, this is we're going to dwell on this a little bit about this, especially this phrase, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Then when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own, but will speak whatever he hears, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. And this is an encounter between Jesus. This is a court scene, if you will, in a way. Uh, Jesus and Pilate, uh, an exchange. You know, Pilate is trying to get to, Jesus is uh, brought before Pilate. Pilate has the power to execute Jesus, and he's trying to get to the truth of it, because we know that Pilate's wife had a dream and said to him, this man is innocent, you shouldn't execute him. But he couldn't really listen to that, and he was trying to find a way out. And so this is Jesus saying, for this I was born, for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. And so then the answer that gets from um, Pilate is, what is truth? What is truth? Because you know, Pilate is like, I don't know which truth to listen to. You, the people who are demanding that you get killed, or my wife that tells me the dream. So let's listen to more to the encounter between Jesus and his disciples. This is part of the speech the Jesus is giving at the end, uh, four to, uh, 14 to 17, chapters 14 through 17. Uh, Jesus is giving a farewell speech, if you will, to his disciples. They know he's, he's going. Uh, or he knows he's leaving them, and so he's giving them his final instructions. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house, there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? And Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now this very scripture, this very scripture is often used to make it sound like Jesus is saying, I am the only truth. There is no other way. So if you're a Muslim, if you're a Jew, if you are a non-believer, then you're going to hell. Have you heard this argument with friends and family sometimes? You know, say, oh, when, when I affirm saying, you know, God is bigger than one religion. God is bigger than what I think and how I grew up and what I tend to believe. Um, and then they come back at me with this scripture saying, well, but Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. You know, what are you doing with this? What do you do with that? Yes, Nandrell. Father Abraham, yes. Right. 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 Great. So you're t telling us that the connection, the way of the truth and the life, going back to another story, to the story of Abraham being the father of the three Abrahamic religions. But what about the Hindus? What about the Buddhists? There are lots of, or Buddhists don't really think of themselves as religious, but um, you think it, it is bigger. So we're going we're gonna to work through this a little bit because it is a troubling scripture and it is one of those things that I love, but then it's tainted. I feel a lot of times, every time I read this, I'm like, oh, it sounds very exclusive. Actually, one time I was doing a funeral for a man who was of uh, Native American background, and the family wanted to make sure 
that you know we read only a part of that scripture and we cut off the part that, that said no one comes to the father except through me because they said oh, we don't want to exclude others we want to make sure I'm like, I get it but you know of course at a funeral you're not going to sit there and try to preach and try to tell the people all about the background but that's not what it really meant that's not what Jesus really meant <laughs> um, but today we're going to look at it from a couple points of view uh, context, of course, is very important. And this is, uh, I love this from Eric Law uh, in his book, Holy Currencies. He talks about the location of the words, uh, the word the truth between way and life. I am the way and the life and the truth, I mean the truth and the life. And thinking about these two, the two words, and think about them uh, in terms of, think of the word way. If you're walking, down a path and you see only a part of the path do you think this is the only way the only part this is the part that we're on here you think no the the road leads you know a lot farther so you don't look at this one it's more complex the same thing of life right now at this moment you're sitting here uh, sue is sitting here for example do we say sue all of her life is right here right now it's more complex. She came from a home. She has family. She has, she's had a past. If she's going to have a future, life is a lot bigger. So we don't look at life in that one way or that one segment. So the invitation is to look at truth in the same way. Right now, maybe that's what we see in this one time and place. But it's all. It's truth is bigger because it's complex. It's multidimensional. And so uh, this is what he says, you know, perhaps the meaning of truth being sandwiched in between multidimensional concepts of the way and the life ought to be understood in a similar way. The spirit of truth calls us to attempt to understand multiple points of view. So Jesus is also inviting the disciples. Notice every time it's connected to him. And it's not because he's trying to say I'm better and Jesus could have, could have said, I'm the only one. And he, remember, he was speaking not to uh, people who are outside of the faith. He wasn't trying to convert anybody. He's talking to Jews as a Jew. So it'd be like us sitting here saying, you know, Michael Vacanti, now you got to believe this because, you know, you got to be saved from being whatever. I know he's, uh, he's served in the church. I mean, it wouldn't make any sense that I'd be telling him to become a Christian, would it? Because he's already committed his life to the way of Christ. It wouldn't make any sense. So in that context, Jesus is speaking to his disciples. They've already committed to his way. They're already Jewish. He's not trying to establish a different religion. He's trying to tell them to follow in his footsteps, in his truth, in the relational stuff he built with them. Again, last week we talked about community and the importance of relationships. So it circles back. Truth is very relational. It depends on the context and the Jesus piece of this is that Jesus was inviting them to know him, uh, inviting them to a circle of discipleship. So they're not sitting there knowing the truth as, okay, I'm going to give you a set of teachings and doctrines, and all you have to do is just believe them. Just repeat them back to me and believe that this is, you know, this is how the truth works. Truth is very relational. And that's, that's a very hard concept for us to, because again, it seems like we're watering down the faith, we're watering down uh, Jesus, we're not really committing our lives to the way of the truth and of the life. But it really is, it's very complex. Truth is always complex. Truth is always bigger than us. God is much, I mean, if we, do, how many of us believe that God is something we can really define? You can't. It's bigger. It's a mystery. We always, we always use language and different images. We, I mean, the songs we use, everything we do is about this mystery. It's kind of love. You can try to define it, but it's hard to define without relationships, isn't it? If, do you believe in love? Well, how, yeah, well, yeah, but what is love to you? How, how many of us agree on how love should be in our relationship? Well, there are big picture pieces, but most of the time, it's specific. 
it's very specific to the context, to the people you're with. Uh, you know, loving someone may require that you don't help them at a certain point. Think about that. You know, love is not always the same. You don't apply the same. It's like if you've had different children, if you're a parent, you can't love uh, the, every child the same way. It's like it does. It's not possible because they need different things from you. And the same thing in relationships at work. Everything is is contextual. Everything is related to relationships. And so Jesus, as I said, he did not invite them to a set of beliefs. He invited them to a way. And actually, the early Christians were known as followers of the way. That's how they were known, followers of the way, because it was about a way of life, a way that connected. And he was at the heart of it. And then he tells them later in that chapter, you're going to do greater things than me because you have the spirit of truth in you the spirit of love, the spirit of connections. You're going to listen to others. And you think of the context of the Gospel of, of John. It was written around the year 90 uh, of the Common Era. There was the, after the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, there was animosity between the Jews and the followers of the, the Jewish followers of Jesus. And there was a rift happening. And so again, truth became important for the Gospel of John to say that it is about a relationship with Jesus. It is about a relationship with the Holy Spirit that he sent. It's about a relationship in the community. So truth and is not objective out there. Uh, he was trying to help his, the people understand the message of faith through Jesus as a way to connect to others. So the currency of truth is all about developing and ability to listen to others. Um, and I'm going to give you a couple of examples because I'm in this heady place. Yes? Another good connection uh, is quoting first, first Corinthians 13, talking about this chapter about love. Love is not envious. Not, love is not boastful. Love does not insist on its own way. Think about that. When we think of truth, we insist on our own, on our own way. It, it doesn't work in, in the way of Jesus. But uh, To Know As We Are Known is a book by uh, uh, Parker Palmer. And Parker Palmer talks a lot about uh, truth as relational. And he says, uh, can, truth can only be found in our personal relationships and only to the extent that we allow ourselves to become vulnerable to it and when we honor and listen to as many voices as possible. Uh, truth, uh, again, he talks about John 18 when uh, Pilate wants to know the truth. He wanted to know the, what is truth. But the story, he says, it further explained it to demonstrate that Christian understanding of truth is not simply an unattached object, which is simply out there, but rather that truth is personal and all truth is known through personal relationships. Truth is not part apart from us in some impersonal way. It involves vulnerable, faithful, and risk-filled interpretation of the knower and the known. So uh, there's not one perspective above the other, but it's uh, developing this currency of truth requires a listening, an openness, and always <coughs> letting God you know, teach us new ways, letting the Holy Spirit speak to us, especially when we're, we get stuck thinking that our way is the only way or that the truth can be managed and controlled and presented in a nice little package that we can give to others. And so how does that play out in, um, in our own lives? And because, you know, this is a, a process, this is something that I'm inviting you to consider as how does this way of looking at truth differ and make a difference in our lives to make us more loving? I wanna give you an example, this is from Canada. Uh, they had from 2007 to 2015, 
uh, what they call it a truth and reconciliation uh, commission because they discovered, of course, it, it was always known for the native people that these residential schools that a lot of the native children were sent to were very abusive in many ways. Of course, they took children out of their own homes. They sent them to these residential schools to wash the native out of them, basically, to get rid, to scrub that, to make them more white. Um, lots of harm, of course, we uh, heard recently about the, the graves. I mean, there's a lot of hard, harsh realities. And you could look at it from a political point of view and divide people, but they looked at it in a different way. They looked at it, they used the example of South Africa, of using a truth and reconciliation uh, kind of work where they t listened to voices, and I love, I love what they did with it, because they said they listened to, to 6,500 witnesses. Listen, imagine how painful that is. You know how when someone tells you uh, you hurt them, how do you enjoy listening to that? And especially if they start describing the depth of their pain of how your words really made them struggle for several years and they, you know, had mental health issues and, you know, it altered their lives. And I'm like, oh my gosh, none of us like to hear that. But there's power in listening to that. There is power in being able to work together because you move forward only when you are able to, to deal with the truth in the sense that you listen to different voices and open yourself, even though it's vulnerable, it's not easy, it's not comfortable, and it's for the one to speak. How many of us, like sometimes, you know, we want to tell the others how they are hurting us, but we don't want to say that because it feels very vulnerable. We lash out, we'd rather be angry at them, we'd rather cut them off, but to tell them, listen, this is how I'm feeling. It's very hard. Again, this truth stuff is not easy. But anyway, so we're gonna watch a couple of videos. I was gonna watch, have us watch one video, but it's such a good story. Um, because this one part is told from a native person's perspective about this, this his experience in the residential schools. I was six years old when they took me to a residential school. I remember the day walking toward that school with my mother. And, and it, it was, was a silent walk, walk and, and I was, was so afraid. 20 or 30 little kids herded into, into the showers, showers. and then your body being painted in white liquid of some kind, kind your, your hair, hair cropped and then doused in, in a kerosene. And that, that was pretty traumatizing. traumatizing. The school held roughly 220 people, half boys, half girls, and we were segregated. If I was caught weaving at my uh, sister, there'd be a punishment for it. And, and so as a result of that segregation, I never really learned any social skills that young people should be learning as they grow up. From a religious and spiritual perspective, of course, the churches lobbied hard to convert indigenous people, people aboriginal people. people they said that we were heathen and pagan they targeted language in those things we had learned through all of millennia to know where we came from to know who we were as something that had to be eliminated before that time, I lived in a place called Guayastems. They call it Guilford Island now. We harvested from the forest all of the animals that we needed to provide us sustenance. And from the ocean in front of us as well, all of the species of whales and mink and fish. And I had a connection to the environment around us. And so after having spent years in those schools, by the time we were ready to leave most of us were pretty broken many of us including myself descended into addictions alcoholism violence and it was pretty pretty uh, difficult those schools lasted for over a hundred years there were over a hundred and fifty thousand little children and the last school that closed in Canada was in 1996 in Saskatchewan. 
there was a history on this land that had been absolutely ignored. Nobody knew about the residential school legacy. Nobody knew about the intent of the Indian Act, the Corona challenges now facing Aboriginals. And we're starting to uh, accept the idea that we have the shared history for which we all are responsible for. When the Truth and Reconciliation Commission report was uh, submitted, I was in the room when Justice Murray Sinter, the chair of the commission, denounced Canada. He had just recited a litany of intensive harms against Aboriginal people. And, and when he said, Canada, you have committed cultural genocide, there was just a silence in that room, and then all of a sudden it erupted in euphoria. We said, survivors want an apology from the Prime Minister in the House of Commons. And I was there and I heard the words, I'm sorry, and then I couldn't see because my eyes were just flowing with tears. I was so happy that somebody had said, I'm sorry. Canada, by the way, is the only Western country that has had a Truth and Reconciliation Commission. So we're trying to look through a new lens. We as Canadians, we as an Aboriginal, we celebrate each other, everybody cheering each other up as we move toward a more equal, prosperous future for all of us. My name is Chief Robert Joseph, and I believe that Truth and Reconciliation is Canada. before the video, but we'll talk right now, and if you uh, could turn to a neighbor and think about what would truth look like in our community? Uh, if we are to develop this currency of truth, who are the voices that we need to listen to? What voices are being silenced? What voices, how do we come to it um, with that sense of connection to the way of Christ? So it's, it's a little complex, but you can take it in any direction. Uh, and there's no test, you're not failing any of this. <laughs> so uh, feel free to turn to a couple of neighbors and talk to them about truth and the currency of truth in your life, in the community, whatever is speaking to you right now.
right, I'm going to call us back together. I know we could be talking for a long time. This is like not a, a simple topic. Um, she, has a great idea. she has a great idea. Okay, we got to listen to Lisa. Lisa, put, put you on the spot. You might be finding something challenging, too, in what I'm saying, so it doesn't have to be an agreement. Yeah. Canada, yeah, very interesting to to see well, that. I, I will say this, because years and years ago, I'll try to make it brief. Actually, things like this happened right around the corner from us. Uh huh. And we don't know. Right. I had a years ago. I had a client. I, I remember her distinctly. She was Native American, and she at the time was living on the Tonawanda Reservation. Mm -hmm. an adult, yeah. So someone who got adopted, a Native American adopted, uh, we're going to have to move yeah. forward because it's getting late. So. <laughs> Ethnicity and culture? We'll have to talk to an anthropologist about this, so <laughs> I apologize. Well, there are different, I mean, and, and a lot of these concepts are human made. you got to remember, I mean, race is not a real thing. Um, it's made up. It really is made up. And, and yet we divide ourselves in such ways uh, around differences and don't see the big picture because we don't want to listen to something that would make us upset. Uh, I recently went to a workshop about, uh, by Nanette Massey. And she, was, uh, she was at the college. Uh, we were taught, it just flashed in my head and that whole sense that everything has to feel comfortable. And that's why we, we struggle talking about race, because we don't feel comfortable. Then people get upset, and then, you know, it, because the truth has to emerge through those relationships instead of trusting one another and saying, you know what, I may say the wrong thing, and I may mess up, but I'm here to listen. I'm here because I care. So you get to the deeper truth because you listen and you care. And to see Jesus as an example for us of that, where he honored every voice, where he honored the people who came to him, and the people who were powerful, but also the people who were on the margins of society. Very different examples. So when you look at that as the way and the truth and the life, it's a very different understanding. It's a more relational way of seeing Jesus. So I invite us, I'm not going to show the, the next video because it's, it's about now they, re they celebrate this uh, work in Canada every year. And they talk about it, and they bring pictures, and they really, you know, kind of like if, have you been in families where they don't talk about death? We were, we've been talking about uh, death recently, and it's like, oh, somebody just moved on, or passed away, or sorry for your loss, but then, or grandma died in her sleep. You don't talk about it because it's uncomfortable to talk about the pain and the loss. And you may start crying if you start talking about somebody's death. And, and it, people have a hard time, but the people that take the time to honor 
someone who dies and they talk about it and they celebrate and they remember them and they bring pictures. It's so powerful, even though it's uncomfortable. It becomes a very healing, powerful way to uh, live life. So I'm going to invite us today to consider all of this. And again, maybe your truth is very different, but truth is again within us. It is not something that you're going to be looking for outside and that's why we need to listen deeply to the spirit speaking to us to our own deeper experiences and detach a little bit from that obsession with facts that it has to be this way and my way over another way because I have the facts um, and, and to really hold it as a conversation as an invitation to a deep relationship with Christ with the community, with all the people of our lives. So I'm going to uh, send us with a blessing because Ben had to leave and we're uh, a little late on this. So this, this is again reminding us of the words of Eric Law about the flow of blessings. These currencies are only good when we share them, when we are able to give and receive and to share with one another. So may you go to praise God from whom all blessings flow, circling through the earth so all may grow, vanquishing fear so all may give, widening grace so all may live. Amen. Go in peace, and I hope to see a lot of you this afternoon. Oh.